Thank you. I would like to first thank the uh, wonderful people at the i 3 Magnetic Society for boasting me the opportunity to be one of these wonderful ladies and gentlemen who <laughs> deliver the distinguished lecture to, uh, this year as well as some of the lectures in the past few years. I would also like to especially thank Dario and Vincent for organizing this school. I understand it's uh, we currently really spent more than eight months working on that. It's a huge amount of work. So on behalf of everybody who enjoyed the school, I should thank you very much. Um, the topic I'm going to introduce to you today is what I call as KBT spin tronics. Now there are different names for that. Some people, my colleagues, call it spin KV tronics, and some people call it KBT magnetics. Uh, the reason that the name is not yet settled is because this is a really a rising field which is formed a few years ago and it is growing rapidly. So before I go to my talk, let me first be showing you those are the wonderful students and the postdocs working in my group in Winnipeg in Canada. And one of them, Jingwei Rao, he is actually in the audience and uh, he has a a poster there related with some topics that I'm going to be talking here. On Thursday night, you also very welcome to go to his post to see more details. Um, if you don't know a uh, University of Manitoba, probably chances are good that you have read one of these wonderful textbooks. And it looks like in my department there is a good tradition that before professors will retire, they spend the time to write a good textbook. But I'm not sure whether I'm going to do that. It's a lot of work. Um, my plan is that uh, I'm going to split my talk into two parts. Because I realize it's a really intense program every day. Seven hours of lectures is a lot. I'm going to break it into two parts. The first part, I will keep it as simple as possible. In fact, I'm trying to bring down this frontier research stuff to the level of the second year undergraduate physics. That's my plan. I'm going to introduce you this quasi particle, which plays the central role in this new field of KVD spintronics, using that to tell you what is KVD spintronics. Then, if you survive that without falling asleep, and if time allows, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the frontier stuff. That's, I have no way to break it down to the undergraduate level. So, I will tell you a little bit about the price we pay for using these things. The reason I would like to do that is if you, nowadays, if you read the papers or go to conferences, uh, People usually tell you the good side of what they do, and they very likely don't tell you the other side, the price they pay, as uh, Professor Otani had mentioned this morning to me. Because in the old days, when we write papers, we really write papers for our friends, and we really want to our friends to uh, get the full picture from the stuff we're talking about. But nowadays, when we write papers, we write papers for the editors, we write papers for our deans, and you tell them only the good side of the story. So I'm trying to tell you as my friend the other side of the story, if my time allows. So to make the things really simple, if you forget all the details that I'm going to tell you, I'm asking you to remember this graph. That's the key point of the story I'm going to tell you. Imagine that photons are birds flying around, and imagine the spins in the solid state materials are animals, localized somewhere, moving slowly. If you lock photons and spins inside one box, like this room, and you call that box as cavity, then the spin and the photons, they will still be interacting with each other. And the consequence of the interacting is that they're going to produce a hybrid beast, which we call SKVT magnum polarity. 
this hybrid list is no longer spinning, no longer photons, but in fact, it keeps the characteristic of both species. And because of that, because of its hybridization nature, this species can talk to, this beast can talk to both species, make it a very effective communicator, or in scientific language, transducer. That is why this quasi-particle, after was discovered a few years ago, becomes very interesting for many people. Many people from different community come and feed this beast. And in fact, that's the reason why it grows very fast. And for the students of this school, if you win this your student projects, if you are interested to come to my lab to feed this beast, you are very welcome to do so. So that's the key story. And that beast is actually created by using KBT techniques. KBT techniques is not a new technique. In fact, it is old techniques that has been used in many, many different fields. The most famous one is that these two gentlemen applied KBT techniques to study atomic physics. And using that, they actually received the 2012 Nobel Prize. And some of the people in the audience, they working in the field, which is 20 years old now, still very active, where people using KVT techniques combined with mechanical oscillator. And in that field, there are a lot of interesting physics coming out, very many useful techniques for uh, quantum information. Speak about quantum information, some of you probably know this iconic uh, device made by Yearbook, where they're using KVT technique, planetary microwave KVT, coupling with qubit. And that is still nowadays one of the uh, most useful techniques to do quantum information and quantum computing physics. KVT spintronic is relatively new, and basically what people do in this new field is they try to combine KVT techniques with collective spin excitation instead of single spin, we're dealing here a system with magnetic material where you have magnums, which means you have many, many spins coherently perform the dynamics. Now, let me begin the story really from the early time. As I told you, people have been using KVT techniques to study atomic physics. In the simplest picture, if you have a single atom, you treat it as a two-level system, then it is essentially a single spin. A single spin is a two-level system. You can describe using a Pauling matrix. And if you have KVT uh, photons, you can treat it to the system as if you have harmonic oscillators for the photon states. If these two systems are coupled together, then there is a quantity which people call as the Rabi frequency describes the strength of coupling of the single spin or single atoms with the photons in KT. The point is that if you want to introduce something really useful induced by this kind of coupling, you want to have the coupling strength as large as possible or the Rabi frequency as high as possible. But at a single atom or single spin level, the Rabi frequency is actually quite low. It is at an order of one hertz. Of course, you don't talk about the coupling strength itself. You have to compare it with something. And this something here is you have to compare it with the decay rate of your single spin system and your photon spin system. When you're doing that, you're using a different quantity, which is called the cooperativity. Cooperativity is a dimensionless uh, quantity, which is defined as coupling strength square, divided by the product of the two decay rates. To achieve a system with strong coupling, you want to have a situation that the cooperativity is much larger than one, which means the states can oscillate it between the two species for many rounds, 
before it is decayed. But to reach that for a single spin or single atom system is very difficult because normally in nature, the cooperativity we have for the single spin system, coupling with photon, is at the order of one. Within one cycle of oscillation, the system has large probability get already decayed. So, several years ago, Prophet said, maybe we should not use a single spin system. We should try with many spin systems. And the idea, one of the ideas is that if we have ferromagnetic material, then we are intrinsically dealing with a system we have large number of spins locked together by their exchange interaction. And in that system, we are dealing with the collective spin excitation, which we call as magnets, quanta of the spin waves. So the question was, what happens if we let magnets, instead of single spin, couple to the photons? And their prophet wrote paper for PIM. The theoretical prediction from the calculation says, at the year 2010, that the coupling terms, rapid frequency, in such a system can be so high, raising from 1 hertz up to the order of terahertz. That's a huge jump of the coupling strength because you are dealing with a huge number of spins. Immediately, it caused a lot of interests. Many groups try to test that experimentally. And the first group demonstrated that effect was my friend Hans Huber at Theo Munich. And he and his colleagues showing that at the very low temperature of 50 meter Kelvin, if you put YIG, YIG material, where you have many, many spins with low damping, you put this material inside a micro cavity, indeed you can cause this collectivist spin system coupled with the cavity photon. And the difference is that because you are dealing with the collective spin operators, the rapid frequency of this coupling system is significantly enhanced compared with the Rabi frequency of single spin. And the enhanced factor is actually proportional to the square root of the number of spins. Because the number of spins in year, if you have sizable samples, say, many size of samples, the number is huge. And that is why the Rabi frequency, the coupling strength of that system, is indeed significantly enhanced compared with the single speed system. Not terahertz, but 100 megahertz is a very large number. And that is why immediately people get very much interested in these coupling systems. Just to give you a picture of what is happening in this collective spin system coupling with photons, let me first use a quantum mechanical pictures, using energy levels, we say this is the zero photon states, the ground states of photon of your KVT. That's the first excitation states, you have one photon. And this excitation energy is basically what you call as the KVT mode of your KVT for your microwaves. And let's say this is ground states for your magnum. And this is your first excitation states of your exciting one magnum. This will be your magnum excitation frequency. In the case of uniform precession, you can call it ferromagnetic resonance frequency, which you can tune it by changing the external magnetic field. Now, if these two systems are coupled, then you will no longer have independent single photon excitation and a single magnum excitation. But these two excitations will mix it together. Quantum mechanically, you can describe your system using the combined ground states, where you have no excitation, and look at the excitation states, take into account of the coupling, you have to introduce, this is essentially uh, one magnetic excitation, zero photon excitation, and that is zero magnetic excitation, but one photon excitation, 
you have to linear combine both excitation and resolve your Hamiltonian given by this case. The situation is very easy to solve, and the consequence is that you will have this kind of hybridized states. You will have states, captains, wave functions from spin, as well as wave functions from your photons. Then you can have these two branches of transitions. If you're changing your external magnetic field, the KVT frequency is independent of your magnetic field, but your magnetic frequency depends on the magnetic field you apply. In a case when the magnetic frequency touches the KVT frequency, these two dispersion were no longer simply crossing with each other because there is coupling. And the strength of the coupling is described by this anti-crossing gap. And in fact, this anti-crossing gap is exactly this Rabi frequency as I explained to you. As you can easily see, this is the order of gigahertz. That means this is order of 100 megahertz. Very large splitting is observable in this kind of spectroscopic measurement in this coupled system. Now, that is a quantum mechanic theory. You can imagine from the undergraduate physics course that if we're moving from a single spin system to a many-way spin system, this correspondence principle should work. That means this kind of coupling phenomena in a many spin system probably also have a classical interpretation. And that is indeed true. So, in the following, I'm going to give you this very simple classical picture at the level of the second year undergraduate course. The simplest way, classically, to describe a microwave cavity is that you imagine there is a microwave current flowing in this microwave cavity. And to describe the microwave current, you can use in this very simple LCR equations, which describes any equivalent microwave circuit. And if you solve that equation for your KVT systems, what you will find is that you will have a so-called KVT mode. The mode of frequency is determined by the equivalent uh, inductance and the capacitance of this equivalent circuit. And of course, you always have certain damping, which is described by this equivalent resistance of your circuit. That determines the so-called Q factor, or the line width of your KVT map. That's very simple to solve. Essentially, you have a result with a north type of line factor uh, shape. Now, Maglons, oh yeah, before I go to Maglons, I should mention one point that Professor Azuela already mentioned very nicely in his talk, lectures. There is an unpaced rule which tells us if you have a microwave current, there would be a microwave magnetic field associated with the microwave current. And these two quantities are phase coherent. That's the key point of the unpaced rule. In other words, the phase of your microwave magnetic field is determined by the phase of microwave current. Keep that in mind. Then let's look at the magnons. In the case of magnons, this community, everybody knows how to solve the problem. You just write down and down if it's equation. And in the case that the processional motion is not so strong, you treat it as if you have linear dynamics then the lambda lift equation goes down essentially to an oscillate equation. And you can solve it to get your magnum modes or ferromagnetic resonance modes determined by the resonance. It has certain damping, which we call as deep damping, determines the line limits. It's like a classical oscillate essentially. It's kind of semi-classical treatment of the quantum phenomena of magnetism. Now here, there is also a very important classical effect that we have to keep in mind. That is, <coughs> if you have these spins doing processional motion, it means that the angular momentum is changing with time. And we have learned if the angular momentum is changing time, 
Faraday's law tells us that is going to produce a changing voltage. Because spin is processing at the given heat at frequencies, the voltage you induce is also at the gigahertz frequency. Now this is important if you put this kind of sample inside the cavity where you have ACI circuit driven by microwave voltage. So you can imagine if you put these two systems together, you will have on the one hand this microwave current through the amp-pace law produce a microwave magnetic field drive the spin dynamics. That's basically what we do when we're doing FMI experiment, many of you are doing that. The difference is that in KBT, particularly in high quality KBT, the density of states of the KBT mode is very sharp, the Q is very small, therefore this KBT state is very sensitive to any back action coming from the spin dynamics. That is something we usually ignore in the FMI experiment. If you take into account of that back action, then you have the dynamic of spin current is also going to impact of the dynamic of your microwaves. So that you have a coupled system. Mathematically, it is very easy to describe because you just need to write down again in a different form your LCR circuit equation your LLG magnetic equation, normally they are independent, but now, because of this action and back action, these two equations are coupled together. So the physics is very similar like two harmonic oscillators coupled together, which is very easy to solve mathematically. If you solve that, you will find that your microwave magnetic field and the spin dynamics in this coupled system, they are no longer independent quantities. Because of this coupling, these quantities will face coherently locked together to give you the so-called eigenmodes, like that. You just put a piece of EX samples into microwave KVT, you send in microwave measuring the transmission. And the KVT mode is not changing with magnetic field, but the magnetic mode is changing when you tune in your external magnetic field. So eventually, you can have this crossing, people call as detuning equals to zero condition, where due to the coupling, you can measure in this anti-crossing, and the Rabi frequency is at the order of 100 megahertz. And this is the experiment actually we did at room temperature. Why this effect is so serious so at room temperature is exactly because correspondence theory tells us the same phenomena can be interpreted classically using the picture of electrical magnetic coupling picture, as I just told you. So that makes the system very interesting because now we are producing a very good bridge, which means coherent link, phase coherent link between photon dynamics, microwave dynamics, and spin dynamics. This bridge, because the cooperativity, the Rabi frequency is so large, it is a very, very good bridge, not so easy to get disturbed by dissipation. And that is why it makes the system very, very useful, this quasi particle very useful. And in fact, depending on the community, people have been using each of the species for many applications. Now, because of this new grid, you can produce many different combinations of links. And that is essentially what people in this community, in this new community, have been doing in the past few years. One of the famous work is that, as I mentioned in the introduction, qubit can be coupled to the microwave resonator. That's how people in the quantum community quantum computation community uh, operate in a grid. Now you have a new link, which links the microwave resonator with the spin system. So scientists at Tokyo University, Chika's colleagues, demonstrated that you can, using this method, transfer the quantum state's information from a qubit first to the microwave resonator, and then to the spin system. 
very exciting bit and opens up a lot of possibilities. People have also been doing with connecting the ferromagnetic system with visible light photons, Curie effect, Faraday rotation, and all those things. Now you have a new link of this uh, strong coupling between microwave photon and the speed. So a beautiful experiment was demonstrated independently by three groups, one from Yale University, one from Tokyo University, one from Cambridge University. They say we can use this spin system, the magnum system, as a transducer like a train station. There we bring the microwave photons first to the train station, and on the other hand, we have highways, optical fibers, for visible light photons. Because both ends, they are very well coupled, you create a system that you can convert in transporting microwave photons to the system of visible light photons. And very, very interesting ways. And in my group, we are using this kind of new link to manipulate spin current. The spin current we have learned this morning from Xiaofeng's uh, lecture, uh, and I will show you one example of that. There will be many, many more uh, work coming out, guaranteed, in the next few years, by making use of these new links. So, let me very briefly tell you the work done in my group using this kind of new link to manipulate the spin current. And the idea is that, as we have learned this morning, that you can use this kind of bilayer device to generate spin current from microwaves. That is what people call a spin pumping. In my simplest language, spin pumping device is something like you have a spin solar cell. Everybody knows solar cells. Solar cells, you have bilayers made of P type of semiconductor and N type of semiconductor. And in the device, you have two types of carriers. You have electron and you have hole. Then you're using sunlight to generate non-equivalent carriers in one of the layer, non-equivalent electron and non-equivalent holes. They are going to diffuse across the interface to the other layer. That is how you produce using sunlight to produce a DC charge current or DC voltage. The same thing happens to the spin. There you're using microwaves to generate non-equivalent spin. Or you can say non-equivalent magnetization. Same, same thing. Those non-equivalent spin is going to diffuse into normal metal. And if you have spin orbit effect, then you can convert this DC and AC spin current into a voltage. So essentially, spin pumping device is a spin solar cells. And many of you actually using that in your own labs. Now the experiment we have done is that now we say the microwave can be used not only for generating non-equivalent spins, but they can also be used to face coherently linking different spin solar cells. To demonstrate that, that we made two spin solar cells and put them inside of the same microwave cavity. Now you can immediately imagine the spin dynamics in one spin solar cell will be coupled to the microwave field due to this beast. And the same microwave field is going to face coherently coupling with the spin dynamics of the second solar cell. And that introduced a coherent link between these two spin solar cells, even if you put them far away, so that between them there is no direct interaction. And in that way, you can use a microwave, like Wi-Fi, in which if you control the spin current in one device, this Wi-Fi will work to tune in the spin current of the other device, because of the link. And the experiment is demonstrated by putting two spin solar cells, one at the front, one at the bottom of the same cavity, 
separating them at the distance of a centimeter so that there is no direct, in, the direct interaction at all. And you can see if you locally measuring spin current of one device, you find a way to control it, detail I you know. If you control your spin current in this way, and you measuring the spin current of the second device, you see that the spin current of the second device is remotely controlled by the first spin device because of the link which I told you. So that's one example that using this quasi particle, now you actually can use in spin current to almost switching on and off the spin current in the distance because they are coherent to link. So that's the first part. Uh, to summarize the first part, let me tell you what is the KVT spin choice. Essentially, in the physical systems, we're using many, many different interesting systems which have different dynamics. For example, we can have optical KVT, where you have optical dynamics happening at the frequency of optical frequency, the coherent time of that device system is relatively low. You can have atomic system where the coherent time for those dynamic process is better, still operating at the optical frequency. And you can have optical fiber, the coherent time is even better. Or at the frequency of microwave, you have superconducting qubit systems, you have microwave KVT and resonator. You have collective spin system from your ferromagnetic materials. And at the radio frequency system, you have mechanical oscillator, or you have nuclear spin systems. All those systems are very interesting. And people understand that particularly for quantum applications, none of the single system will be good enough you have to find a way to coherently linking those systems together to give you the desired application or functions. So KVT Spintronics is very much focused on the strong coupling, coherent link, between microwave resonator and the many-body spin systems. And this coherent link, this strong coupling, is going to produce this hybrid beast. Already, experiment has demonstrated that this hybrid beast can communicate very effectively with many other systems, and that is why not only people from the magnetism interested in that, really people from all of those other communities getting more and more interested in this new field. That's the first. Now I'm going to turn to the second part, which I'm afraid is a little bit hard stuff, which I have difficulty to make it simpler. But let me just uh, tell you, you should not be scared by any technical details that I cannot explain very clearly. And for a good reason, not because I say that. In fact, on the way here, on the airplane, I took a book which Xiaofeng recommended to me to read written by Neon Cooper. Obviously everybody knows Cooper Pear. That's the guy who invented the Cooper Pear and got a Nobel Prize for that. And he wrote a book which is not really about physics, but more generally about science and how to teach science. And there is a one opinion that both Xiaofeng and I like very much. And that is he was talking to teachers but I think it is also good advice for students. What he said is that science must be taught for the teachers, which I changed that to learn, as my way, with emphasis on logic and the structure, rather than as a collection of facts, those technical details, that deliver the current scientific worldview. Essentially, if you translate in a simple language, it means if you don't understand the technical details, there's a wonderful lecture telling you, don't worry about it. You have the slides. Just pay attention to the logic. 
that they try to take. Now, if you're using that perspective to look at the first part of talk, which I told you, you actually realize that there is a bad logic here in the new field of KVT speech choice. Because we all know the message of this guy. He basically tells us the direction of science, with all professors writing grants, usually starting from his idea, saying we should go to matter, we should go to quantum systems. But you realize the logic of this KVT spin chonic is the opposite. We are coming from the single spin system back to the many body macroscopic spin systems. For good reason, as I told you in the first part, because your Rabi frequency is enhanced by many order of magnitude. That's why we do that against this good logic that he was teaching us. Now when you do that, you of course pay a price. The price you pay, it's a little bit technical, is that if you have a single spin system, you just bring in one photon, then this single spin system is got excited to the, the excited states. Bring in second photon, there's nowhere it can go in the energy ladder. Experts say the system is saturated. And because of that, you will find, and people know very well, that the rapid frequency of that single spin system is actually proportional to the number of the spin you give to that system. Because adding spin to that will not bring the spin system to the high energy level, but force the spin oscillating much faster between the spin states and the photon states. That is because you have nonlinear dynamics of a failure. Now, if you're moving from the single spin world to a many body, magnum, many spin systems, the situation is totally changed. As we know, magnums are bosons. You can excite in as many as possible magnums in your systems. It looks like a harmonic oscillator ladder. Because of that, you are dealing in that system the linear dynamics of many bosons. And because of that, this capability, using the photon number to control the coupling, is totally lost in the KVT spin shock system. Many groups have tried many experiments in the past few years. They always find out the Rabi frequency is independent of the photon number, very differently from atomic system and single spin system. It has been puzzled for quite a few years. Now we understand it very well. It means fact that we cannot control the Rabi frequency field the mind with power. That's the price we pay from the single spin system to the many spin system. Related with that, in the single spin system, because of this linearity, actually people always see the so-called lunar triplet. If you want to look at a little bit detail in that, lunar triplet means that the system knows how many photons you have in your system coupling with the single spin. And every photon level will be split due to Rabi splitting. That produces this typical lunar triplet in spectroscopic measurement. In other words, lunar triplet is the signature that you have now in reality in these systems. Very technical, I know. Okay, you see, totally okay. But you remember that in our KVT spintronic system, we never see lunar triplet. Everybody sees this tree. Antiquity. And that is because this linearity is totally killed when we're moving from the single system to the many spin system. That's the price we pay. But many people in the past few years try to reintroduce the linearity into these many body systems. That allows you to access to the total number states associated with that many useful uh, capability you need, the linearity. One method is that the Tokyo group couple that system to the qubit. And because qubit is a very nonlinear two-level system, this inject nonlinearity into that system. And detail you can read from the very nice science paper. And also other groups say, 
perhaps we can use the laminearity of magnetization dynamics. If we drive the spin precession at a logical angle, then I'm no longer dealing with the linear dynamic of magnons, but I'm dealing with the nonlinear dynamics, as Professor Asvel is expert in that, then you probably introduce nonlinearity in that system. And that's correct. And there's a very nice paper coming out this year. And in my group, we are using a third method. We're using this side of capability. Instead of using a simple microwave KBT, we're using a very special feedback KBT, which I'm going to quickly explain to you how it works and what kind of benefits you can get from that. Using that, we can also bring linearity to the system, as I'm going to show you in the next few minutes. Now, using the KBT techniques, these active KBT techniques, we will be able to use the many body dynamics of this beast. No longer just a single beast, but we're going to lock billions of these beasts together, forcing them dancing coherent. And that gives you that linearity. How do we do that? We first make a KBT, put the egg on top of that. This is now plenary microwave KBT. Then we know if we introduce strong coupling, the coupling is going to produce this beast. We can produce many beasts, but all those beasts are phase incoherent. They're generated by exciting different magnets through the phase incoherent FMR process. The trick is that if you introduce a second KBT, that KBT collecting all the photons leaking out of the first one, and you phase coherently amplify that, you feed those photons phase coherently back. Then those photons is going to see all the beasts in your KBT, and they're going to interact coherently with all the beasts in the KBT. Then you see funny many body effect, as you sometimes see the birds in the sky. If you have many birds dancing, if there is certain phase correlation between them, you can see sort of beautiful pattern of this many body system. And that is what we see in this type of device. Instead of this very simple anti-crossing curve, you now see very beautiful five resonances. And if you look very carefully, these five resonances can be grouped into two sets of Muller triplet. One set following the solid line, the other set following the dashed line. They are beautifully overlapped together. And as I told you already, that observing Muller triplet indicates that you inject the nonlinearity into your coupling systems. And therefore you're expecting the photon number control of the rapid splitting, this guy, probably is restored in your coupling system. And that is indeed true. If you look at the rapid splitting, and you're changing the number of photons you feed back, you see very clearly the rapid splitting is enhanced by increasing the photon. What it means is that now you have a sort of free lunch. You have on the one hand many spins which enhances your rapid splitting. On the other hand, the linearity is still reserved in that feedback technique so that you can still use the photon number to control the coupling, or reversely, using this coupling physics to detect photon number states, and they cannot have used that. So what happens here? Forget all those technical details and the facts. What's the logic here? Well, the logic is that we all know the logic told by uh, this gentleman going quantum. But in solid state physics, there is actually another powerful logic for paths. And that powerful logic is very well written by a science paper of Anderson, P. Anderson. And there, the key message is that in the many body systems, because of the complexity of many body systems, there are actually a lot of surprising physics, new physics can emerge. And that is the second logic, actually, we are using here. 
So these are the details of why you can have this two set of ruler triplet. But I just skip that. The key message is that if you're using this kind of idea, you can construct a Hamiltonian. From the Hamiltonian, you can calculate the dispersion, and the calculation agrees with the experiment perfectly well, so that you can believe me. Take home message of the second part is I hope I told you that indeed, as Anderson told us, more is different. Not just going to the quantum world is a good pass, but going to the many body system is also equivalent, very powerful path. And essentially, the first part I told you is that more spin is better than a single spin. Because using more spins, you produce this quasi particle, this piece of KVT magnum polariton, that significantly enhances the Rabi frequency many, many order of magnitude. And in the second part of my lecture, I'm trying to tell you that more of this beast is better than a single beast. Using these feedback techniques, you can actually even reinstall the so-called nonlinearity in these many spin systems, which was very difficult to do in the past few years. And with that, I'm coming back to the summary of the two parts. I hope I convinced you that in this new field of the KVT spin tronics, at least there are two parts. In fact, there are many, many parts. The nice thing about this field is that it's a new field. Therefore, it's not crowded. When you're doing experiments there, you are not competing with any of your colleagues. You can choose the effect that you like to do do it very peacefully, quietly, and write papers for your friend instead of rushing write papers for editors or your deans. That's really nice thing of this new field. And using that, you can produce this beast, and you can produce billions of these beasts to together and make many new 